Well, this morning we're going to um, bite off the, uh, the next section of John's Gospel. We're going to be looking at verses 4 through 9. But what I'd like to do is simply back up to verse 1 and read through verse 9. So John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 through verse 9. Would you listen carefully to this? This is God's Word. John writes to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Now, I hope you can recognize with me at the outset that these words are not entirely clear to understand. John's gospel uses a lot of figurative uh, language. John seems to be thinking in these terms, and we know that the, the, uh, the Word of God was given in such a way that it reflects the character of the person writing it, and yet it is still entirely 100% the Word of God. Well, We see that John's writings reflect a certain kind of mindset, and we just need to get into that mindset. And particularly as John is introducing his gospel in verses uh, 1 through 18, as I mentioned before, he seems to uh, use a great deal of theological thinking, we might put it, somewhat abstract. Jesus is the life, and Jesus is the light. Well, that's what we want uh, to look at this morning. Don't be surprised if we have to put our thinking caps on again in order to understand what John is referring to. Well, again, John, as I have mentioned, wrote this letter to introduce us to Jesus and to prove to us who it is that, that Jesus is, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And his purpose behind it is that you might believe that and in believing receive the life that Jesus Christ has, the eternal life which is in himself. Now, not surprisingly, he begins the letter, as I've already mentioned, with a heavy emphasis on the deity of Jesus Christ. Last week, we saw him say that the Word, that is Jesus, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, is eternal. He is the one who was there in the very beginning. He was, uh, as verse 1 reminds us, in the beginning was the Word. And in verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. And what John means by that is that that at that point, we can't say that point in time, but at that particular point just before creation when there was no time, when there was only eternity, Jesus was there. The Son of God was there. Now, he must be God because God alone dwells outside of time. God alone is in eternity. We saw that John said Jesus made everything. He made everything that is created. Verse 3, all things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing has come into being that has come into being. Now, I'll remind you that John was not saying that Jesus was some kind of an instrument or a conduit or an agent by which God created, but rather he is the creator himself. All things came into being by him. Remember, that's just simply the passive voice And we see who the agent of creation is through this preposition through or by. But he is the one who in fact created. The Bible says in Genesis 1.1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, John is telling us that Jesus or the Word is the one who did this. He is God. And of course we saw that John says as much in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Now, he doesn't say that the word was a God, as the Jehovah's Witnesses say. The Bible says there is only one God, one true God. Every other God is a false God. John cannot be saying that Jesus is a false God. And we understand again, as we saw last week, our little you know, grammar lesson, the reason why the definite article is not used with the word God in this context is because John wants to distinguish the subject from the predicate. The subject is the word, and what's being predicated of the word is he is God in the full sense of the word. It's very clear that that is what John thought about Jesus. Now remember that John is not just going to tell us that Jesus is God, although that would be enough because John is writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What he is giving to us is the word of God that proves it. But he's also going to show us that Jesus is God by recording what Jesus said and what Jesus did to prove it. Of course, that's going to come throughout the entire epistle. That's the reason why, or the, uh, the gospel. That's why he wrote it. But then the last thing we saw is that, that John pointed out that there was at least one other person who was present with the Word who is called God. In verse 1, the Word was with God. And in verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. John is going to give us several indications through his gospel that God is multi-personal, that he is in fact triune. There's going to be three persons he points out who are God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But again now, John isn't finished telling us again who Jesus Christ is and trying to point out to us his deity. This morning, he gives us two more things about Jesus that highlight that particular uh, fact. Two things, that he has life in himself and that he is the light of men. Now first of all, I want us to look at the fact that Jesus has life in himself and I think as we sort of examine this subject, we're going to see that there is more to Jesus perhaps than we originally thought met the eye, although I think we'll also see it comes out of everything we already know about him. John writes regarding Jesus in verse 4, in him was life. Now what does John mean by that? You know, in today's world, we, we tend to take life for granted, don't we? We see life everywhere around us. I mean, we see it in bacteria, although thankfully we don't see it, but we do know it's around. We see it in the plants that are around us, all the different types of vegetation, all the insects that continually are bothering us in many ways, but also, of course, are helping us by cross-pollination and so forth. We see reptiles periodically, some we don't want to see, like snakes. We see birds. We see various kinds of mammals. We see life everywhere, and of course, we also see Mankind. Now, where does all this life come from? The majority of people, at least in Western culture, believe that life is just simply inevitable. That it's something that, that given enough time, will just simply rise out of matter. Rise out of the stuff, out of the dirt, out of the ground. That's what evolution is really all about. See, life is really not anything unusual. It's just inevitable. It's just the way things are. Now, certainly, they don't believe it's just popping up everywhere, that it took a certain amount of combination of things for it to happen, and, uh, but they believe, given enough time, it was certain to take place. I hope you know enough about life to know that it isn't inevitable. The more we study life, the more we see that life doesn't just happen, that life isn't necessary, that life doesn't explain itself. I mean, even if we have all this information, even if we grant all the information that exists in the DNA molecule, which we know is, is a vast amount of information, there's no reason why lifeless molecules should all work together as they do to make life possible. As a matter of fact, we look at these molecules moving around and we wonder how is it they're doing it. Life points beyond itself to one who actually gives life to one who is life itself it points to God now in Genesis 1 we read about how life came about how God spoke and the earth was formed how God separated the water from the dry land how he commanded and plants and trees appeared and then fish and birds 
and land animals. And we read in Genesis 2 how it is that man came about in Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. We read here about how man's creation was actually quite special, how God was personally involved in it, how God didn't just speak and man sprung out of the earth, a whole race of men, as it were, came forth like it did with all the other creatures, but how God, as it were, came down and formed one man from the dust of the ground. And, of course, he made woman uh, from this man. And that while man was yet an inanimate creature, while he was fully man, as it were, except for his soul, he wasn't yet alive, God breathed into his body the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, I want you to notice two things about this account. I, I, I don't want to miss the implications here for evolution. That the Bible says evolution can't be true. If you believe the Bible, you cannot believe in evolution. Not even a theistic evolution where God is somehow involved in this process of, you know, as it were, amoeba to man. Evolution teaches us that a single living cell over millions of years and going through myriads of, of mutations and changes uh, narrowed down through natural selection so that only the strongest, as it were, mutations survive, how this bacteria eventually became man. In other words, evolution teaches that man came from something that was already alive, that life was evolving for millions of years before man came into being. Well, God tells us that he made man directly from the dust of the ground and that man didn't even begin to live until he was already for, a fully formed man. It wasn't until God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. But this secondly tells us where it is that life comes from. It doesn't come from the, uh, from the earth. It doesn't come from matter itself. It comes from God. It isn't inevitable the outcome of, of enough matter, as it were, and the right combination of matter in enough time, it's something that God gives, and only God can give it, because He alone has it. But you see, who is it that John tells us possesses this life and the ability to impart life? He says, it's Jesus. Again, in verse 4, he writes, in Him was life. Well, who was it in the beginning who was speaking and bringing all of these things into existence? Who was it that entered into the garden, as it were, and formed man from the dust of the ground? Who was it that breathed life into his nostrils and made him alive? Well, it was actually the Son of God. I would remind you what John says again in verse 3 of John chapter 1. All things came into being by him or through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus is the one who has life in himself. He is the author of life. He is the one who imparts life. But of course, you know this isn't the only kind of life that Jesus has to give. Jesus is also the one who possesses eternal life, spiritual life in himself. And he is the one who gives that to whom he wills. Now, he says that quite plainly later in John's Gospel, in John chapter 5, verses 24 through 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. You see, Jesus has a life in himself. Jesus is the author of physical life. And Jesus is the author of spiritual life. As a matter of fact, this morning, if you have heard the voice of the Son of God and you are a believer, it's because he has given you spiritual life, eternal life. Jesus is the reason why all of us are alive today. 
And he is the reason that you who are saved have eternal life because as God, Jesus has life in himself. So first of all, John is, is again pointing to the deity of Christ because God alone is the one who has life in itself. It's kind of hard to define what life is. It's not just motion, it's not just activity. We have a way of sort of defining biological life, eat, breathes, and excretes, and so forth. That's how science defines life, but life is this animation, as it were, this, this movement of molecules that creates consciousness, that creates a variety of other things. Well, that life is something only God has and only he can give. Jesus has that life. And so he is God. Now I wanted to emphasize the two kinds of life that, that Jesus possesses so that this next part will make more sense. We see secondly that Jesus is the light. Again in verse 4. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Now, just as there's two senses in which Jesus has life in himself, there's at least two senses in which he is the light of men. I think, first of all, that Jesus is the light in the sense that he is the source of knowledge. We've already read how he created our souls. He gave us the ability to think when he breathed life into our father, Adam, and he became a living soul. Along with that life came intellectual Light. You might say that God turned the lights on upstairs. He gave us the ability to take in information. He gave us senses through which we gain information. He gave us the ability to take that information and to form ideas in our imaginations and to think about those things and to contemplate those things and to make deductions from them. The Son of God is the one who has given you that ability, has given you light. And really, this is just one of the ways in which God tells us that we are made in his image, that we know we exist and we have the ability to think. We have a rational mind. We can take information and we can think about it. Now, Jesus has also, besides giving you the faculty of thinking, he has also given you the degree of, of light that you have with regard to intelligence and knowledge. You know, all of us have varying degrees of intelligence. Jesus is the one who gave you what you have. We all have varying degrees of knowledge. Well, Jesus is the one who has also given you that knowledge. By the way, I've mentioned this before, but I think it's entirely true. Jesus is the one who also gives or withholds knowledge to the world, which is why sometimes men make discoveries. The reason why one man does and another doesn't is because Jesus has revealed it to him. And the reason why he does it one time rather than another is, again, because of him. Jesus is the light of men. Jesus is the one who gave Adam the knowledge that he had in the garden. He wasn't simply like a, like a newborn infant with a blank slate in his mind as he was a fully grown man in the garden. Whatever knowledge he had, the Lord gave him. Knowledge of himself and of the world around him. Jesus also gave him the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. It's the same knowledge, except in a much clearer form, that he has given to you and to everyone who has come into this world. Even before you read his word, even before you were familiar with the Ten Commandments or the law of God, you knew what it is that God wanted from you. And you knew that through conscience. Jesus is the one who gives light to the entire world every day of the existence of God through the creation. We read in, in Psalm 19, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Now, the reason why I'm emphasizing this particular kind of light, the light of the ability to think, the light of knowledge, the light of, of conscience, the light of this general revelation of God is because these are at least some of the things that are wrapped up in what Jesus, well, what, what John means when he writes in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness. 
The darkness that he's referring to is the condition that the world is in since the fall. Men fell into ignorance and they fell into sin through the fall of man. But Jesus shines the light. He shines the truth about God through the creation. He shines the truth of his righteousness through conscience. And Paul tells us that these these revelations that Jesus gives as he shines his light into the world actually get through to man. We read in Romans verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Well, how do men respond to it? Do they understand it? He says, being understood through what has been made. Do they have any excuse for not believing? No. They are without excuse. Jesus is the light which shines in the darkness. And really, in the light of creation and in the light of conscience, he tells us no one has any excuse for not believing in God. No one has any excuse for their sin. All men know that what they are doing is wrong. And as a matter of fact, that's what all men do apart from the grace of God. They only do what is wrong and again if they happen to do what is right formally they don't do it for the right reasons but they all know and they know because the light is shining in the darkness without Jesus shining this light all men would be in absolute darkness well that's not the only way that Jesus shines as I mentioned before he shines this natural light or this light to all men but he also shone in a particular way the light to his old covenant people through the types and the shadows and the prophecies he was shining his redemptive light and of course when Jesus came into the world which I think is what John is emphasizing here he shines this light through his life through his words through his works Jesus is the light and he gives a, a natural light you might say and a redemptive light now, I think I've already answered this question, but let's move on to address what it is that John says next. Does the fact that Jesus is shining this light into the darkness and is giving light to all men, does that mean that all men are going to be saved? No. John tells us in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, we do need to try to make sense out of this word comprehend because we just read that Paul said it actually does get through. And all men see it clearly and they're without excuse. Well, here's where we have to really come to grips with what the word comprehend means. It can mean either to understand or it can mean to overtake or overpower something. I don't believe that um, John means by this that they don't understand it. I do think he means that they cannot stop it. They cannot suppress it. Although both may be true in a certain sense. I mean, for instance, the light that he gives through natural revelation does get through to the mind. Paul says they understand it, but it's not welcome. They don't want to see it. They don't want to keep it in their minds. They want to suppress it and put it out of their minds so that they can live with themselves. We read in Romans 1, verses 18 through 19. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. They see it, but it's not welcome. They see it, but they don't want to see it. They want it to suppress it. And that may be why perhaps the word in the sense of comprehending may also apply. Because if you ask, you know, people on the street, especially those hardened atheists like Richard Dawkins, do you see that God exists in creation? He'll tell you no. He doesn't see it. And yet Paul says he sees it clearly and he's without excuse. Does that mean that Paul's wrong? Does that mean that God's wrong and Dawkins is right? No, it means that because of his sin, he has so suppressed the knowledge of God out of his mind that he no longer sees it. Yet, he is accountable because God has shown him. We are accountable with what we do with that knowledge. 
The unconverted Jews did the same thing with the light that Jesus gave them through the, the old covenant types and shadows and with the clearer light of the gospel. Do you know that Jesus went around performing all these signs that we're going to read about in John's gospel and there were many Jews who saw it, many leaders of the Jews. But what did they do with that light? Did they receive Jesus Christ? Well, not the leaders. We get a little bit of insight into what they were thinking in John 11, verses 47 through 50. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now he did not say this on his own initiative of being high priest that, that year. He prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Now, Caiaphas didn't know that's what he meant. What he thought he meant by that was, we need to take Jesus and kill him, because otherwise the Romans are going to come and take away our nation and our place. It's expedient that he die, rather than the Romans come and destroy us. Well, this is how the Jews responded to the light of Jesus Christ, at least these unbelieving Jews. They suppressed it. But as we also know, they weren't able to overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness was not able to overtake it, was not able to overwhelm it, even though they did seek to suppress it. Now, the Jewish leaders and all the Jews were even more inexcusable because God sent a messenger to prepare the way. He sent John the Baptist. We read in verses 6 through 8, There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all may believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Now, the Bible tells us that John was, as a matter of fact, a light who was sent ahead of Jesus to prepare the way for the greater light. We read in John 5, verse 35. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Now the light that John was shining, of course, was he was pointing the way to Jesus. He was getting the people ready to receive the light when he actually came. And of course, when Jesus came after John actually understood who he was, seeing the Spirit of God descending upon him at his baptism, afterwards he declares this in John 1.29, when he sees Jesus again, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So John was a light who was pointing to the greater light in order that those who see the light might actually come to know him. I think John concludes this particular section by again pointing out who Jesus is. He is the light who illumines the whole world. John writes in verse 9, There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. By the way, this is a verse that um, several churches look at differently. This is the verse that the uh, Wesleyans use to uh, prove, at least in their understanding, that everyone has a certain amount of grace a prevenient grace that even though we're all dead in trespass and sin, even though our minds are darkened and our hearts are darkened, as it were, and we really have no ability to trust in Jesus. By the way, Wesley believed that. He also believed that God gives a grace that comes before salvation that enables everyone to believe, and he sees it in this verse. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. I mean, what more do you want, right? And the Quakers also use this to uh, justify their meetings as they meet together, waiting for the light of God, as it were, to shine into their minds so that they can get up and speak. 
uh, and edify the people of God who are gathered in a, in a Quaker meeting. Nobody actually prepares to, to deliver a sermon. They all just come together and they wait for God to reveal something to them. But that's not really what John is referring to here, either of these two scenarios. As a matter of fact, I don't even think in this translation that it's put together properly. This verse should really be translated, there was the true light which enlightens every man coming into the world. As a matter of fact, the word order in Greek lends itself to this translation. Now Jesus isn't saying, or I should say, John isn't saying that Jesus began to enlighten every man when he came into the world because that's what the first reading actually says. We've already seen that Jesus is busy enlightening men in many different ways. He gives light to everyone who comes into the world, the light of reason, the light of conscience, the light of creation. To the Jews, he gave the light of the gospel in the Old Covenant. And in the New Covenant, he gives the light of his gospel, not just to Jews, but also to Gentiles, to as many as he wills. Jesus was shining this light long before he came into the world. Okay? But what he's saying is that Jesus is the light who enlightens every man who comes into the world. You see, that makes much more sense. And he has been doing so through the creation and through conscience from the very beginning. And since, of course, he gave that revelation to the Old Covenant Jews, to the Jews, and since he is spreading the gospel around the world today, he is giving it through the gospel to as many as he wills. Not everybody has his redemptive revelation. Not everybody has the gospel. But those to whom he wills, they have it. Now John wants you to know that Jesus is God. He is the light. He is the revelation of God. He's going to go on to, to show us in the next few verses that this word who becomes flesh and tabernacles among us, he is the one who explains God to us. He is the one who reveals God. Well, he's been doing that from the very beginning to Adam and Eve and to all their children in the ways we've already seen. He is the light who shines the light of his truth so that you may receive the life that is in him, eternal life. Now again, he gives you physical life, but he is also the one who gives you this truth to lead you to eternal life because if all you have is physical life, you're going to perish in your sins. You need spiritual life. You need to be born again. You need to have the Spirit of God. You need to receive the light that Jesus is giving to you so that you might receive his life. And so in closing, let me ask you this question. Have you seen his light? I mean, he has revealed himself to you in many different ways already. I mean, he's revealed himself to you in your minds. The fact that you have a mind a consciousness that you know that you exist, that you can reason, it points to the fact that God exists. I mean, how is this stuff that you're made of able to think the way that it does? It's only because the one who has life has given you life. The one who has light has shown his light in your mind. Has the light of creation broken in on you? As Paul says, it displays the wisdom and power of God and its design. Has that convinced you that God is? Has the light of your conscience convinced you that you're guilty and that you need forgiveness because it tells you that you have sinned against God? Has the light of his gospel, the revelation of his great love and his mercy through the cross, the offer of his pardon and peace, has that convinced you that you need to come to Jesus Christ and receive his life? Have you received the life that is in the Lord Jesus Christ? Remember, the reason why he gives you this light is so that you might escape judgment, the judgment that you deserve for your sins. Today, if you hear his voice, don't suppress the light. Don't try to put it out of your thinking, out of your minds, so that you can live with yourself. If you do this, Jesus says you will die in your sins. And once 
you're dead, it's too late to do anything about it. There is nothing left but eternal punishment. Let his light lead you away from your sins to him, that you might trust in him and live. Now, the reason why he warns us of judgment and the reason why he's given you even that light is for the sole purpose of leading you to life. If you perish, it's your own fault. It's not his fault. He's done absolutely everything that is necessary. And he gives it to you as a free offer. Receive his offer. Receive his, his life. Listen to what he has to tell you. And do what he tells you. And you will be safe. Well, may the Lord grant by his grace that each of us might listen and live. Let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us to do this.